on the hits. Hello, and welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ana Mateo. This program is made for English learners, so we speak a bit slower. And we use words and sentences especially written for people learning English. Here are the stories we have for you on today's program. First, the education report. Dan Friedel will tell us about college athletes in the United States and their money making possibilities. Today in the United States, it's the 4th of July, our Independence Day. To celebrate, Mario Ritter will bring us a story about the 4th of July. I will return with this week's words and their stories. And we will finish the broadcast with our series on America's presidents, written and hosted by Kelly Jean Kelly. But first, here is Dan Friedel with the Education Report. An American college football player makes the winning touchdown in a game watched by millions of people on television. Suddenly, many people around the United States know his name. But unless he becomes a professional athlete in the National Football League, he cannot make any money from being famous. It was that way for around 100 years, but it changed last week. On July 1st, about 460,000 college and university athletes in all sports were permitted to make money from their fame. The organization that runs college sports in the U.S. is the National Collegiate Athletic Association or NCAA. For years, the NCAA punished athletes who took money from supporters. In fact, some athletes chose not to attend college or to leave school after a year or two because they could not earn money from their athletic ability and fame. Those athletes include basketball player LeBron James, and Olympic swimmer Katie Ledecky. The NCAA decided it would no longer punish athletes who wanted to make money from their fame on June 30th. The decision came one day before 12 states were set to permit college athletes to make money by appearing in advertisements for products or saying they liked items in social media posts. The states included Alabama, Florida, and Texas. They all have well-known college sports teams, especially in the nation's most wealthy sport, American football. For many years, when people said college athletes should be able to earn money, the NCAA argued that they already had a good deal. They were given tuition money in return for the many hours each week spent practicing their sport. At some private universities, four years of tuition can cost well over $100,000. Then, television began paying millions of dollars to show the games. Coaches became famous and wealthy. The players started to think they were no longer getting a good deal. One former college basketball player, Ed O'Bannon, brought a legal case against the NCAA and a video game company. O'Bannon went to the University of California in Los Angeles, known as UCLA, in the 1990s. He argued he should be paid after finding that a character that looked like him 
was being used in a video game. Eventually, a court in California said the NCAA was breaking national labor rules. All of those events led to the NCAA's decision. However, experts say the NCAA will likely limit the products and services young athletes can support. Each state will be able to make its own rules. For example, in Texas, students cannot make money by supporting companies that sell alcohol, tobacco, or offer people the chance to risk their money by gambling on sports. In addition, the NCAA plans to make sure universities do not pay athletes directly or give them money in exchange for choosing their school. Michael Rueda is a lawyer and an expert in sports and entertainment. He said the new rules will cause a bit of chaos. Some businesses are already trying to work with college athletes. A business called GoPuff operates in 650 cities. It delivers food and other items. GoPuff is offering athletes a chance to make money by making supportive statements on social media. Rick Karcher is a professor in sports management at Eastern Michigan University. He said, It is too early to predict how much money the athletes will make. He warned, however, that the money is limited and that athletes will be competing against each other. Graham Mertz is a well-known football player at the University of Wisconsin. He has created a text image known as a logo for himself that he can use on social media. DePaul University in Chicago said it created a business program to teach athletes about ways to make money from their name. Athletes, however, will need to be careful about supporting products and companies that compete with those that give money to their universities. For example, it is unlikely that an athlete will be allowed to support Coke if their school gets a lot of money from Pepsi. For now, it looks as if the chaos Rueda talked about will only last for a short time. Experts think the rules will become stronger over time. In addition, Karcher said it is unclear if the ability to make money will be worth it for some students. If an athlete can only earn about $500 per year, he wondered, is it worth all the time and thought and effort trying to get it? I'm Dan Friedel. Thanks, Dan. Now let's hear from Mario Ritter. July 4, 1776, is the day the Continental Congress officially approved the Declaration of Independence. Celebrations began soon after with parades, public readings, and other events. Fighting in the nation's war for independence had already begun. But it was not until 1870 that the U.S. Congress passed a law to set July 4th as the National Observance of Independence Day. The law was updated in 1938 and again in 1941. Recently, another holiday to mark American independence was established by the U.S. Congress. The Juneteenth National Independence Day Act observes the end of slavery in the United States. The U.S. now officially observes 11 yearly holidays. 
state and local gatherings for Independence Day and other holidays are as old as the country itself. The Pulitzer Prize-winning historian Eric Foner said national holidays were a way to unify the nation after the Civil War. The Civil War consolidated national power in all sorts of ways, and national holidays are an illustration of that, he said. Some observers point out that Independence Day has been caught up in the country's divisions from a very early time. In the 1780s and 1790s, two political sides argued over who should get credit for writing the Declaration of Independence. The document famously declares that all men are created equal. The Democratic Republicans, led by Thomas Jefferson, thought that he should get the credit while supporters of a strong central government, the Federalists, said others helped too. In the years before the Civil War, black Americans were often not included in official July 4th events. Instead, they would celebrate on July 5th. The black writer Frederick Douglass gave his well-known speech, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July, on July 5, 1852, at an anti-slavery gathering in New York. There is discussion in the U.S. about whether it is right to observe July 4th as Independence Day. The debates involve questions about the country's beginnings and the ideas expressed in the Declaration of Independence. Some say the meaning of July 4th continues to change over time. They note that Franklin Roosevelt and George W. Bush were among the presidents who honored the military in Independence Day speeches. Last year, former President Donald Trump gave a speech at Mount Rushmore in the state of South Dakota. At the time, the coronavirus health crisis was intensifying, but there also were protests across the country. The Mount Rushmore Memorial includes huge sculptures of the faces of four American presidents. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, and Theodore Roosevelt. Trump praised those leaders and criticized people who would damage or deface statues representing the nation's founders. At the time, then-presidential candidate Joe Biden released a video. In it, he said that the country had not yet lived up to the promise of equality. He noted that Jefferson was a slaveholder. America is no fairy tale, Biden said. It struggles with two forces, he said. The idea that all men and women, all people, are created equal, and the racism that has torn us apart. I'm Mario Ritter, Jr. Thanks, Mario. And now, welcome to Words and Their Stories. On this show, we explore words and expressions in American English. We sometimes explain where they come from. We give examples and notes on usage. Today, we talk about that huge burning star in the sky, the sun. If you spend all day out in the sun without proper protection, you might get sunburned. But other than that, Spending time outdoors in the sun 
can be a wonderful thing. To feel the sun's rays on your face can feel really good, especially for those who have been inside for long periods of time. And that brings us to today's expression, to have your day in the sun. We use it a couple of different ways. When you have your day in the sun, you have achieved the highest possible level of success. You are at your peak. You are having a heyday. You are at your pinnacle or zenith of success. These words are all synonyms. They mean nearly the same. In terms of meaning a period of success, to have a day in the sun can be more specific. It can be a brief period of time when a person becomes very successful or popular compared to the rest of their otherwise not very successful or popular life. So something new has happened to throw them into the spotlight, or rather, sunlight. Sometimes these periods of time are much shorter than a day. They last for only a moment. So with this expression, you can also say a moment in the sun. For example, recently many people found their moment in the sun by sharing funny videos on YouTube or TikTok. Sometimes when we use this expression, we do not specify the amount of time. We simply say to have your time in the sun. This usually means the person is young or successful. For example, once a young man was very successful as a music producer. He was so successful that many people became jealous, but he had worked hard for it, and now it was simply his time in the sun. Now let's hear this expression used in a short conversation. Hey, did you hear the news? Clara is moving to Chicago. She just accepted a job as vice president for a Fortune 500 company. Wow, that is big news. Good for her. She has been working hard for years now. She has. It's time she had her moment in the sun. I think it's going to be longer than a moment. She has always been very ambitious. Everyone should have their moment in the sun. American artist Andy Warhol famously said that everyone has 15 minutes of fame. Those 15 minutes would be their moments to shine. They would be their moments in the sun. I hope all of our listeners have their day in the sun. And that's all the time we have for this Words in Their Stories. Until next time, I'm Ana Mateo. And now, Kelly Jean Kelly. VOA Learning English presents America's Presidents. Today we are talking about Warren Harding. He was the 29th President of the United States. Harding was very different from the 28th President, Woodrow Wilson, Wilson supported change. Harding promised a return to normalcy. Wilson took steps to protect American workers. Harding often worked to protect business owners. 
Wilson was slow in supporting voting rights for women and in accepting African-American people as equal to whites. Harding supported women's suffrage and civil rights for African-Americans. Yet both men were popular during their years in office. Today, however, historians usually think of Wilson as one of America's best presidents. But Harding is remembered as one of the worst. Warren Harding was the eighth president from the state of Ohio. His parents were both doctors. Harding spoke about having a happy childhood, growing up on a farm with his brothers and sisters. Some of his favorite early activities were performing in a band and working on his college newspaper. Later, Harding, along with two friends, bought a newspaper. It became successful for several reasons. Harding was kind to his employees and shared the company's profits with them. He also tried not to publish stories that criticized politicians or politics from any party. Finally, he married a woman who had an excellent head for business. Florence Kling Harding led the newspaper's circulation department. She also helped to direct her husband's political career. In time, Warren Harding became a state senator, a lieutenant governor of Ohio, and then a member of the U.S. Senate. He especially liked being a senator, and many of the other lawmakers liked him. One reason is because Harding rarely took a controversial position on any issue. Instead, he accepted most of the ideas of the Republican Party. He was also good-looking and had an excellent speaking voice. These qualities helped earn him the Republican presidential nomination in 1920. A few months later, he easily won the national election. President Harding took office shortly after World War I ended. He promised to make Americans feel calm again and also improve the nation's prosperity. Two of Harding's goals were to support business and to limit immigration. He succeeded on both issues. His administration reduced taxes for big businesses and wealthy people. It also increased tariffs, taxes on foreign imports. And the Harding administration put in place new rules on immigration. The rules made it easier for immigrants from northern Europe to enter the country, but harder for immigrants from Russia, eastern, and central Europe. Harding also took steps to improve the effectiveness of the federal government. But his administration is remembered mostly for its problems. At the beginning of his term, Harding reportedly told friends that the job of being president was too much for him. He appeared to want to do well, and he worked hard. But he turned over most of the responsibility to his friends in the cabinet. A few were very able but some were dishonest. They abused their positions to gain wealth for themselves and their families. One of the most famous examples of corruption during Harding's administration is known as the Teapot Dome scandal. The name Teapot Dome comes from a rock in the state of Wyoming. 
the rock looked like a teapot. Scientists correctly believed that oil could be found in the ground underneath it. At the time, the U.S. Navy depended on oil to fuel its ships. So the federal government claimed the land in case the Navy needed to use the oil in an emergency. But a cabinet official who was a friend of Harding took control of the land. He gave a private company permission to search for oil on it in exchange for a large amount of money. Some lawmakers became suspicious, so they opened an investigation. In time, lawyers proved the act of corruption. Harding's friend was the first person to be found guilty of a crime while serving as a cabinet official. But President Harding did not live to see his friend go to jail. The investigation was just beginning when Harding took a trip to the West Coast to campaign for his policies. Some say that Harding was also trying to escape the problems in his administration. He reportedly told one reporter that worrying about what his friends were doing kept him awake at nights. During the trip, Harding showed signs of not being in good health. Doctors thought he could have food poisoning or pneumonia. He was taken to a hotel in San Francisco, California. For a day, he appeared to be feeling better. He was sitting up in bed, and then suddenly his body shook and collapsed. He died instantly. Reports at the time differed on the cause of Harding's death. Some even said that his wife poisoned the president to protect him from being punished for the wrongdoing in his administration. But most historians think that he had long suffered from heart failure and was struck by a heart attack. He was 57. Millions of Americans mourned over Warren Harding's death. They stood beside railroad tracks as his body traveled from California back to Washington, D.C. The following year, Florence Harding also died. She and her husband are buried together under a grand memorial in their hometown in Ohio. But in the years after his death, Harding's public image worsened. More corruption scandals in his administration came to light, and some historians have criticized him for not having a clear idea about how he wanted to lead the country. In 1927, a woman published a book saying she had a long but secret relationship with Harding, both before and during his presidency. She also said he was the father of her daughter. Genetic testing has confirmed her claim. More than 30 years after her book was published, a lawyer discovered love letters from Harding to a different woman. They confirmed that he had a long romantic affair with the wife of one of his friends. Harding had also been married at the time. These reports as well as the corruption during his administration, damaged Harding's public image. But he also seemed to know that he would not be remembered as one of the best occupants of the White House. Instead, he tried to be likable and modest. He called himself a man of limited talents, who was not fit for the office of president. I'm Kelly Jean Kelly. And that's our program for today. Thanks for listening. Join us again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. 
I'm Ana Mateo.